Miss Tidball, you were the first social service director in the state of Idaho. That's right. And what was the date that you came to Idaho? I came in um, June of 1934. In June of 1934. Yes. And uh, how did you ever happen to come to the state of Idaho? Because I understood you were a resident of Washington. Well, I was uh, back at the uh, National Conference of Social Work in um, Kansas City, and um, uh, it seems that Aubrey Williams, who was the transient director and Harry Hopkins' assistant um, of the ERA program, had been to Idaho and advised Governor Ross that um, it would be essential for him to have a social service department. And Idaho was getting a lot, was receiving a lot of money from the federal government, and uh, they felt it was very important that they have a social service department. And on this on this basis, Mr. Horsfall, who was the uh, state director, administrative director of Idaho Emergency Relief, had gone back to Kansas City to uh, see what the various programs were upon suggestion of Aubrey Williams, and while he was back there, he realized that uh, it was a program that they had overlooked and needed, and he took along with him um, a woman from Idaho who was uh, a director of what they call women's work at that point in Idaho. Women's work? Women's work, uh -huh. and which was a program of employment for women. and. Um, when they returned, they did it. He did it. The, Mr. Horsfall did advise the governor that he felt it was important that they establish a social service program. And uh, uh, my name had been given to them by the federal officials as a possibility of a person who had experience and might be someone that would take the assignment. And. Uh Mr. Pritchard, uh, you were one of the early social workers in Idaho. I wondered what was the time that you came with the public welfare program? I started in September of 1934. 1934. And where were you sent when you first came to Idaho to work? <laughs> I was sent to Pocatello to work in the transient program. In the federal transient program, yeah. uh -huh. and that was your home community, wasn't that was it? My home. And what was your particular assignment there? I was the caseworker for the uh, what we called the treatment center, and this is the uh, the place where all the transient men and boys came to register for food, lodging, help and also the caseworker for the work camp, which we had up in the mountains. We were trying to keep the transients from moving on and trying to stabilize them. I see. And, uh, how many shelters were there in the state of Idaho at that time? Do you remember? I don't remember. Yes. I think probably only two. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, didn't Sandpoint have one? Sandpoint had one, but at a later time. Mm -hmm. This is true. Well, Pocatello was the uh, such a railroad center, and I think this is probably the reason that they had the first um, treatment center, as they called it, set up there in the first work camp. I believe that was the beginning. Mm -hmm. Clyde, could you describe uh, uh, for us how the men came in on box cars? and flat cars, how they came into Pocatello? Oh, they came any place they get a, uh, any place on which they could find a ride on a train, they would be there. They were riding underneath on the rods. They'd be on top of the box cars, on top of freight cars, and then they would get into empty cars. And by the time they arrived in Pocatello, they were uh, very, very hungry, exhausted. Some of them had been on the 
uh, cars without any food or water for over 24 hours when they stopped there. And these were really the victims of the Depression? These were the victims of the Depression. These were not the hobos. Yes. We had a wide variety there. It was amazing the number of PhDs that I uh, registered and interviewed at that time. Even some doctors. Yes. Mm -hmm. Were there whole families coming together? Yes, and we also had a family transient program. And there were whole families, but the families usually were coming in by car. Yes. And the single men and boys were the ones that were coming in on the railroad. And well, I worked in the men's division, not in the family. What was your responsibility to them? My responsibility was to, first of all, uh, register them, see that they had food, could get cl cleaned up and have clothing, and a place to rest and sleep. And the next responsibility was to see if we could possibly stop them from continuing on the road. And we did have the work pro program, which was up in the work camp. And this was very similar to the type of work that the CCCs were doing. It was working up in the mountains. They were working in the forest. They were uh, building camps, which the people could use. They were building, actually, roads into the mountains. Blister rust control. And blister rust control was another thing that they were working on. And, and once we could get them stopped, then after a period of time, which I no longer remember, then they could be eligible to stay on, on the regular relief program. But our great in purpose here was to try to stop this movement because it was so futile just like a wave of people through the whole United States. Oh, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tremendous wave. And the, my memory of the, of, of the man is a, such an extremely positive one. These were men who felt that they could not do anything where they lived, and they were doing their damnedest to improve their own lot. They were, they were men of courage and Men of ambition, these were not men who were trying to duck out. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. I think, I think the reason they had the uh, transient program wasn't it because of our uh, state residence laws that, um, that they uh, either had to just stay put where they were and face defeat and disaster, mm -hmm or they had to get out on the road. And once they got on the road and crossed the state line, they were ineligible for any type of assistance at all. And so the federal government then stepped in and established the federal transient program so that all persons in the country could eat and have a place to sleep and uh, so forth. Because at that point, we still had residence laws that decided whether you ate or, or not. Yes. We also had medical care for them. We, in, in the tre treatment program in Pocatello, we actually had an infirmary. And uh, we had nurses, and the sick, the sick transients could be treated medically. Mm -hmm. Well, this was a federal program. I wonder was it under the jurisdiction of the state uh, welfare program? Well, yes. As state director, I was responsible for the federal program, and that was under the state <coughs> Department of Social Services. But in actuality, we had a state social service director who operated the program independently because there was more elasticity uh, in the program, and we could do things for people that we couldn't do for state residents. And many of them, of course, needed more attention because... Uh, as we've said, that they were away from home and they were without resources of any kind. They couldn't call on family or local resources. And the federal transient program was developed so that these people who really tried to improve themselves could really not starve to death. That was really the basis of it. 
Now, here was a state that had no social work, uh, very limited even private agencies, and I expect no professionally trained social workers at the time you came. Uh, I'm wondering what the attitude about social work was when you came in. Had people ever heard of it? Did they have any idea what it was as a profession? Well, I think the Red Cross had done a very good job in um, Idaho in terms of uh, uh, early programs, that the Red Cross program and the use of volunteers had exposed some people to uh, the art and desire to help people. And uh, uh, the philosophy was inherent there. And they, I met several um, old Red Cross workers who had settled in Idaho, and they were very understanding and helpful. But that was not in terms of a vast national emergency such as we were into. And uh, they were understanding, and they wanted to help, but the concept of uh, what uh, a big mass unemployment program was, was hard for anyone to conceive. I mean, and the farmers themselves, for instance, had had borrowed, had bank loans in terms of crops, in terms of seed loans, in terms of everything. The banks owned everything. The farmers didn't own their property at all. And there really uh, was, there was really no social service anyplace. And furthermore, it was, um, Idaho was highly political. And the governor really and the politicians had been running it. And so when social service came in, they came in the back door, and the program was already operating um, on a basis that uh, it was pretty hard to push yourself forward and do a job. Do you mean there was political corruption within the state? I would say that political corruption was very high and extremely high. And uh, um, the needs of a family were not paramount. It was the needs of the party. And if you knew the party manager, or if you knew the party boss, or if you knew the party buddy, uh, you could eat. And otherwise, then, um, you found it pretty difficult. And it was, it was interesting, however, when I left, and I got letters saying they felt that the social service way, a great many people wrote and said they felt the social service way was the only equitable way to take care of people in, a, in an emergency like this. So, who was governor at that time? Governor Ross. Governor C. Ben Ross? Yes, C. Ben Ross, yes. I understand that his wife was quite an influence on what he did as governor. Yes, his wife was very active in the Lady Maccabees. And um, she uh, uh, used the Lady Maccabees as a, um, a potent force in getting votes for Governor Ross to get him elected. Who were the Lady Maccabees? Well, that's a lodge. And uh, I really don't know uh, what the lodge is, but um, it's a lodge. And uh, I remember shortly after the election that uh, one of the politicians in the state office came to me with a long payroll of pages and wanted me to sign it. And, um, oh, why should I sign it? And he said, well, these people, you have the biggest payroll in the state. And he said, these people um, have to be paid. And uh, well, I said, why should they be on my payroll? Well, he said, you just can go ahead and sign it. And so forth. Well, we're, I said, well, we're spending federal money. And I could be indicted for spending, for signing a payroll to pay Lady Maccabees, and who had just gone out to help elect Governor Ross. And so forth. Well, I didn't sign it, of course, and I was reprimanded the gentleman who presented me with the payroll as to why he'd think I'd sign it. But uh, that is a good example of how very corrupt it was, that uh, politics was foremost. And uh, what party was in party power at that Democrats. time? Democrats. Democrats. And the Democrats, of course, were federally trying to keep in power. This is when Roosevelt was trying to and Farley were trying to oust uh, Borah. To get rid of Idaho Senator Borah. Right. They didn't want him around. He was kind of a menace. I guess he talked a little bit, and they didn't like him. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was rumored, I know, that Governor Ross was in, influenced in the decisions he made by a fortune teller who lived in Pocatello, Idaho. Mr. Pritchard, could you tell her about, us about that? Indeed I can. <laughs> her name was Minnie. 
and she read fortunes by vibrations. She held these large group meetings in her home and each person would give too many something that had been on his person, a ring, a wristwatch, something like that. These were always re returned, by the way. There was no question it, about her keeping it. And, and she would pick these up, and from the vibrations, then she would tell the fortune of each individual. Well, she, I don't know how she had secured her influence on Roth, but she did. And every major decision that he made in politics, as far as I know, he always consulted many. Uh, Did she have a last name? I can't remember her last name after all yeah. these years. But she was the one, for example, who, who told him that if he would drill for water just south of Pocatello, and this is during a period of great drought, and we were rationed in, in water all summer long. He, she said if he would drill for water there, he would find it. Actually, where he drilled, there were some old Indian petroglyphs which indicated the presence of water. These were petroglyphs on the lava rocks south of Pocatello. Ross is mayor began the drilling, and it was called Ross's Folly. And he hit an inexhaustible supply of water for Pocatello, which still keeps Pocatello blooming. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Some of these decisions were wisely made That's based on her experience on that. On that. But, but she was in Boise most of the time after he became governor by... He had brought he brought her up there, and she, he did consult her. Yes. Wasn't she on relief herself? Vinnie? I don't remember that. She could have been, but I honestly don't remember that. Yes. She did very well on the fortune telling. I must admit. <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> Miss Didball. Uh, what were your responsibilities when you first took over the job as state director? What were some of the major responsibilities you had? Well, I think the major responsibility was to um, assess the personnel. That was the first, was to assess the personnel that was uh, operating and to see, if possible, what personnel uh, would uh, like to continue on and would be capable of continuing on. Um, um, and carry, help carry the program forward. I think the second uh, major thing, in addition to assessing the uh, ERA personnel in the Social Service Department, which was mediocre, for instance, you had 2,000 families and I think two workers, so the personnel was not very numerous. Um, the, uh, the second was to assess the uh, uh, community in terms of resources available, that is, what agencies were uh, operating and existing and uh, um, um, could be called in to uh, give additional resources. And I think the third was in terms of personnel was to try and obtain an application blank since nobody knew who was who an application blank on everybody that was on the payroll and see who they were and why they were on the payroll and what their jobs were. I think that was really the first thing to do. And um, uh, it became very evident early as the um, um, personnel was assessed and so forth that uh, um, it was necessary to set up records as to who was receiving the relief and uh, I remember in the first assessment that there were 500 cards, I believe, in the Boise office alone that were marked as receiving relief, and yet when these people went out, visitors went out to call them, they were very incensed, they'd never received anything. So nobody really knows who the 500 were who got the relief that the 500 were supposed to be getting. <laughs> 
So you never knew where this public money went. No. There was no, no accountability no, whatever. No accountability at all. And um, it was amazing that, um, uh, I know it was amazing to me that a department, an auditing department, where they were spending mostly federal funds, would have been so lax in not uh, wanting to know who these people were. And yet the city, ma the county manager was the one who certified them and put them on relief or work relief, whatever it was. And of course, there was no rhyme or reason as to whether you had two kids or, or eight kids. Well, maybe you got the same budget, and maybe the one with eight got more, or with two children got more than the one with eight ki children. Nobody, there was no budget. So of course, then the fourth thing was to, if possible, set up a budget. So I, the first person I really hired was a trained home economist who had been with the Smith Hughes, um, a federal Smith Hughes program in Idaho, knew Idaho, knew food, was well qualified and well trained, and she set up budgets. And what was her name? Her name was Marie Smith. Marie Smith. Marie Smith. And uh, she set up budgets as to how much food a family of two should have and for and so forth and how much rent they should pay and what have you, and clothing and so forth. Well done. And this was the first time that and fam the families on relief appreciated it. They saw for the first time that they were being individualized in terms of their needs. And prior to this, the decisions about eligibility as to who I get relief was determined entirely by the county um, manager. manager. And their political clout. And their political clout. Were these political appointees through the state, the managers politically appointed? I really don't know. Um, I suspect that they must have had a long political record of some kind, either in the state or the county, probably both. I was too busy to really run down the politics, except I just was dealing with it every day. Uh, you must have needed to recruit a staff in order to develop a social service department, Ms. Tidball. I wondered where did you find the people to work for you as social workers? Well, there was, there was a great deal of criticism in the beginning. In the first place, Governor Ross said at the time the program was initiated that only Idaho people could be employed, <coughs> that all the jobs were for Idaho people. Um, so in turn, I had to reflect on that and see uh, where you could hire the kind of persons who might accept training, because it was obvious that there were only uh, maybe two trained workers in in the state and um, uh, that you would have to run training courses and the very first emphasis on the program was uh, uh, the objective was to recruit people who would be trained who would be trainable and uh, as I saw the application blanks when they came in it was obvious that um, that most of them were not um, in, would not be interested in training. And yet, as I saw the new, uh, as some of the new ones coming in, they were young people, and so I already made up my mind that the people to recruit were the young college group, and in the Depression they couldn't get jobs, and that they were a potential pool to try and recruit to come into the program and then run special training courses and train them. So one of the first persons um, I was able to bring into the program was a um, trained social worker from Cleveland and she had uh, expected to go and work for me in, in Seattle and they referred her to me when I went to Idaho since, because she was from Idaho and so I hired her as the training specialist and she set up training courses immediately. I think after about three months we had training courses running to try and train people um, into um, the basics of how you really can help people over and above budgets that uh, there were certain methods by which you could help people and other methods which would injure them. And what was her name? And her name was Lois Porterfield and she was from Western Reserve, well qualified, excellent person and I had met her originally at Kansas City and she was going to come on to Seattle then and work and yet she was delighted to come to Idaho and take this position and did a marvelous job of training. 
Were there uh, others that you were able to bring out from outside the state since the governor had objected to this idea? Uh, no, only in terms of the federal program. The federal transient program was open. The, the governor had no restrictions over that, could have none, because it was 100% federally financed. And he could not restrict uh, uh, no outsiders. And so the uh, transient, the head of the transient social service program was from out of the state. Another time, the governor uh, got into a bind up in Wallace and Kellogg, where they'd formally killed the governor over a strike in the mines up there. Is that right? The governor was subsequently killed. Yeah, that's right. And uh, he was afraid of it, so he sent me in and said it was my job. And uh, it was a real hot spot that the program was being run by ex-mine employees who knew everybody. And if you had been a good employee, according to their uh, frame of reference, you ate. And if not, you didn't get anything. And so the um, U.S. Employment or a labor department came out and protested this vigorously. And uh, when I went up there at the governor's request, it was true that uh, the, um, it should have been protested, and the mine owners were willing to uh, accept an outsider, and the governor did not protest it because he wanted that situation taken care of. In fact, he was just afraid of it. It had killed one governor, and he didn't really choose to get that deep into it again. And so this one person came in for a brief period to clean up a really very bad mess. And what was the name of that person? Uh, that person was Elsa Schubert. Elsa Schubert. Yes, she was not a trained worker, but she was an excellent community organization person. And uh, she was able to work with people, and I had worked with her over there in terms of uh, coal mines in... Uh, uh, Renton and and so forth, and knew what she could do with lay people, and she did a good job. And then she left and went home, and uh, we then tried to train a, a new uh, worker from local to go in and take it over, which they did. What were the names of some of the uh, Idaho people, of the young people you recruited to come into the program? Well, one of them was Mr. Uh, John Milner. I, I really didn't recruit him, but he was in the program, and I early, his application blank came in, and it was very evident that Mr. Milner was a very, very qualified young man who, in the Depression, had just finished Stanford, and uh, he probably couldn't get a job for some time. Nobody could get jobs in this period. And um, I wanted to meet him, and I had him come in from up in the sticks of salmon, and, and uh, as I did with all the young ones, because I wanted to know who was available, because they were the ones I was counting on to build the Idaho program, since I was only there for one year. Any other names you remember? Clyde Pritchard. Clyde Pritchard was uh, out of, uh, 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 came in, and the program in terms of uh, uh, these a transient program in Pocatello, and uh, he did a beautiful job there. The only thing Clyde did that caused a little rumpus was that the doctor, we've already told about that though, haven't we? The, the doctor uh, who was in charge of the transient camps was a state senator, and Clyde called me one day and said, what was he going to do that the doctor had left the transient camp with all the pro medical problems, gone to the state legislature in Boise, and uh, uh, he didn't know he had no doctor and no replacement had been planned. And I suddenly realized, well, he was on my payroll, so I said, well, we'd just take him off the payroll for Clyde to go ahead and hire somebody else. Well, just then, uh, this word got to the governor that uh, m the doctor had been taken off the payroll and the whole dome of the Capitol and Boise began to rock and roll. <laughs> All hell broke loose. <laughs> uh, Mr. Pritchard, uh, being one of the early social workers uh, and continuing your career in social work uh, gives you some understanding of the changes that come and the responsibilities of the caseworkers or the practitioners. 
who were at that time called home visitors, weren't they? And I wonder if you'd describe a little what a home visitor did. Well, I didn't operate in the uh, resident program for relief. It was only in the transient program. But if I remember correctly, the home visitors actually uh, did two major things originally. They, uh, when social service was finally established, they took the applications from the clients and if in their judgment immediate relief was necessary, uh, they were able to secure vouchers, for example, for food, even for lodging, that type of thing. Then uh, a visit would may be made and they would try to when the tape was turned over you were discussing some of the responsibilities of the home visitors in the late 1930s. Would you like to continue? The home visitor actually made a visit to the home of the client and talked to the family. Uh, during this visit the visitor would try to see what resources might be possible for the family to use. He also would see what the family actually needed, not only in the way of, clo of food, but in clothing and bedding and that type of thing. Then we did have programs in addition to the uh, relief. Some relief was given in cash. Some, in order to take care of uh, immediate needs, were vouchers which were issued to the stores, which the stores honored. Then we had a, what was called the Surplus Commodity Division, in which we had food, which was, I guess, surplus food from different parts of the country. And this would vary according to the different season. But uh, there was always some food available there. I remember one time when there were an awful lot of oranges when you could hardly see oranges in the, in the stores in Pocatello. Then we had to set up what was called sewing rooms. Women were employed and were paid on a hourly basis according to the budget of the family. And clothing was actually made for the relief client. And the visitor could send in a clothing order to the sewing room, and clothing could thus be secured without having to purchase it. And then during the time that the client was on the relief, there were per periodic visits to the home, and clients did come in to see their, uh, their visitors when emergencies and crises would come up. Uh, in the state that had never known social services, uh, it must have been difficult to really get acceptance of this profession within the state and to develop programs in relation uh, to the needs of the state. And I'm wondering, Stidball, what were these organizations that tended to possibly block the development of social services within the state, such as political organizations or religious organizations or whatever else? Well, I think there's no question that, um, um, and I admit probably in error, maybe not, um, I had to start on the basis that uh, the program would be accepted. And I think by going ahead on that premise that it was possible to initiate certain values in a program that you knew basically were going to be accepted on the long pull, but not immediately. That is uh, what Mr. Pritchard has said in terms of uh, the home visiting and all of that. Um, 
you knew immediately when this budget was set up and when visitors went out that they couldn't be trained as you wanted them to be trained and you knew that they um, they couldn't do the job that you wanted to have done but on the other hand that you had to start someplace and by starting on this premise with a very positive attitude toward um, eligibility and toward helping people um, you at least got the, the kind of infants, infancy of social service concept into play because really individualization was as basic as you could be that you individualized families and had respect for the families. These were as basic principles that you could start with and uh, they in turn would, could move into um, a real social service program. I think that the uh, old employees who had been in the program answering their questions specifically resented this. No question about it. They resented it. They resented the social service coming in because they saw it as, an, uh, um, as a power, having a power and um, authority that they did not have. And um, they really recognized, I think, that it was federal money being spent and these people were really right um, in determining the needs of people on an individual basis but they resented their authority being taken away from them. And I think administratively, um, uh, what happened was that the administrator, state administrator, um, uh, really played the governor, played to the governor. He was hired by the governor, and uh, there was no social service or, or no so civil service or anything like that. And um, he was hired by the governor, and he was... Uh, he didn't send out word to the counties that they were to follow any routine or anything. He just let the chips fall where they may. And um, that was pretty rugged for the social service. The very idea of giving anyone relief or giving welfare help to anyone must have uh, been a shock to a state that had always prided itself on its independence and this kind of thing. An example, uh, I know there's a large population of Latter-day Saint or Mormons in the state of Idaho, and uh, it's been my understanding that this church uh, has always claimed to have taken care of its own people, and I wondered if this was true during the Depression years. Well, I think Mr. Pritchard has said no, and I would say no, no. Um, I think that uh, there's no question about it that the Mormons uh, were taxed beyond their capacity and they couldn't possibly take care of the needs of the people. Now they use surplus commodities and uh, down in many counties, southern counties in um, Idaho, the surplus commodities were given out in the Mormon churches and the Mormons came to the church. Now whether the people thought the church was giving them the surplus commodities, I don't know. But I do know that on a flying squadron survey that we made, um, the uh, uh, voice was expressed by many people that they didn't get their, their surplus commodities from the federal government, they got them from the Mormon church. And that's no doubt the reason, that's no doubt because they were given out through the church. And they were also, they had a, to give a collection. They gave a collection when they picked up their surplus commodities. You mean they gave a <coughs> money to the church when they got their That's commodities? Right. See, Would you like to comment on this? Well, one of the problems that we had in at least one southern Idaho county was that we had a bishop who was head of our county welfare program. A Mormon bishop? A Mormon bishop, and he was taking tithing from the relief checks. Uh, he had been stopped by a Mr. Milner at one point, and later on was stopped by a Mr. Pritchard. <laughs> so that he took 10% of the welfare check that the clients received. That's right. He took 10%. And, uh, did any percentage of this go to him personally? Not as far as I know. I, I think it really went to the church. I, I would never question his honesty in that and and to him it was a difficult 
uh, thing for him to accept that he didn't have a right as the bishop to demand tithing because uh, this is what the Mormons expected of everyone. But uh, it was not for him as a person, it was for his church. I see. Even, even though the federal government was supplying the money, it was still uh, money from the church. And I know another case up in Idaho Falls where there were two lines of people, people waiting hours, and I said to uh, Marge, the director, I said, well, why can't you organize this better? Why do these people have to stand in line so long? Well, she said, why do you have two lines? And she said, well, they stand in line. One line is to get their check. Then they have to stand in line for the county uh, manager, who's a Mormon bishop, to cash it and take out the tithe. And so they have to have the two lines. This because is the same county I, I was referring to. Idaho exactly. Falls. This was Idaho at Idaho Falls. Falls. Yes. Were there many Mormons on public welfare? Were oh, you? many, many in southern Idaho. I remember one I'm sure there county, were. Uh, Malad was the county seat. Yeah. It was, it was practically 100 percent yeah. there. Uh, again, the, 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 no church could have possibly no, no. picked up the load that came. Uh, they did help out. They had their uh, can't remember what they called them canning plants. And people could bring in their fruit and vegetables and yeah. and can them, and then they would give a certain percentage to be distributed to the poor. Mm -hmm. And they were. Uh, they were very generous in that one area in which they could be, but as far as any real financial assistance or uh, underwriting a family, it, it just wasn't possible. And I was so badly that the church had to sort of take the stand that we are, we are doing it when I think everybody would have understood that nobody, no church could have done that at that time. Well, they did continue their medical program, though. That uh, They did continue that, and when babies were born, they would take their units into their homes and take care of the, of the you know, sort of midwives at birth, and, that, and they had a very good uh, medical program. But as Mr. Pritchard said, they just weren't equal to it. Nobody was equal to it, not even the federal government. <laughs> sure. Just overwhelming. Ms. Tidball, uh, you were in the state of Idaho for one year, and I wondered what led to your leaving, because you really plowed the ground to develop social services in that state, and they've continued through the years since. But I wondered why you left so soon. I left unexpectedly because the governor requested my departure. You mean you were fired? I, well, yes, and gently. I told the governor that when I went, I was to be there one year. But when the dome of the Capitol began to rock and uh, we took the doctor off the payroll and the legislature was in session and all the politicians from all over Idaho descended and talked about that social service program and what it had done to their clout in every county, in every city. The governor said, called up the uh, state administrator and told him he'd have to fire me. And I very pleasantly told the state administrator I was sorry he couldn't fire me because I had been hired by the governor and was understood that I would be there for a year. And so then the governor called me back and he said I would have to go because he couldn't take the pressure anymore. And uh, so I was fired. I was there only the 10 months. Isn't that right? Yeah. About a 10 months period on that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And where did you go from Idaho? Well, I went to uh, California. And I was hired there. Um, I tried to resign several times, but the federal knew that uh, uh, someone had to stay with this as long as they could. And um, so they agreed if I would stay, that they would take care of me when when it came. I I knew and they knew it couldn't last. That, that is stay in Idaho. Yes, they knew and I knew that it couldn't. I couldn't stay in Idaho because we were trying to do something that it was so unheard of. And so I came to California and was hired by Charlie Shotland because Idaho or California was having a, the same sort of thing. And they had divided uh, Los Angeles County in five regions. 
to try to get a hold of it because it was such a mess. And uh, I was then uh, assigned to Pasadena and Pomona and Alhambra and Lincoln uh, districts to try and uh, clean those up. And uh, so the struggle began all over again. But you are now experienced. <laughs> I've now, I've now retired. <laughs> uh, who replaced you in Idaho after you left? At the time I left, I don't know. Um, I don't know who. There was no replacement. The governor said he was going to try baskets of food. And um, I understood that there were delegations and so forth. At the time I went there, the governor assigned two young men, um, Mr. Peter Cohn, and Mr. Orville Peet to help me, and they were helpful. Uh, they set up various programs and so forth. They were helpful. And I believe, I'm not sure, but I believe Mr. Cohn was appointed uh, as the director after I left, but I'm not sure. Yes. I, I leave a job, and I always leave it. And uh, so my history uh, subsequent to departure is never very clear. Peter Cohen did succeed. Mrs. Titball. He actually had succeeded the head of the Transient Bureau in Idaho, a man under whom I worked who had been fired. And Pete took his job. Then when Anita left, he was appointed in her position and another man named Kenneth Tipton, I, I beg your pardon, he, Peter Cohen headed up the emergency to work for an Idaho, a man under whom I worked, who had been fired. And Pete took his job. Then when Anita left, he was appointed in her position, and another man named Kenneth Tipton, I'm, I beg your pardon, he, Peter Cohen, headed up the emergency the re relief program. He did not take the position Anita held. Uh, and Mr. Cohen appointed him, uh, Kenneth Tipton, to head the social service department. This was a man who was completely untrained in social work. Yeah. He was untrained as a social worker and yet made state director of social work. Was, was that a political appointment? I honestly don't know. He, he was a friend of, of uh, Mr. Cohen's, I know that. And I was un unaware of any political power that uh, Mr. Tipton may have had. Pete Cohen had political where did, power. Where did T Tipton come from? Now, Davis Reed, he knew her, you said. Well, I, I said know. that. You said that. I said yeah. that. I don't know. I thought originally he came from Boise. I don't know. Did you want to add something about the response? Mr. Well, as I look back on that period, the thing I really wanted to comment upon was not the responsibility, but the attitude. Uh, it, it didn't occur to anyone I ever knew working in the program as a social worker that any individual or family could be blamed for the situation in which they were caught. And we therefore, maybe naively, but we therefore went in reading very non-judgmentally and very open to hear what the family had to say. And it wasn't until we worked for quite some time that we became, I think, aware of the different kind of individual problems that existed. But we did go in on this non-judgmental basis, and we were accepted, and I think this is the reason that we were. We saw so many of our own friends who needed help, and we saw men who had uh, made actually made fortunes who now had to have relief. We saw people who had been most prudent and wise in savings and conserving, and, uh, and everything was being wiped out. So how did this economic thing be a, an individual responsibility? When the banks had gone broke. The dedication of the workers at that time was uh, quite remarkable, wasn't it, in terms of giving time? Oh, yes. Yeah. 
the hours that we used to work. There were days when I and many other workers put in 20 hours a day in order to help these people who, who so desperately needed help. And I remember on my first traveling job, and this was true of John Milner too, it never occurred to us that we traveled on our working time. We always traveled to get there when the office opened, and we'd work in the evening, and then we'd go on to the next place at night or early in the morning. But to travel on working time would have been unthinkable. Well, I think this is all very true, Mr. Pritchard, but <clears throat> in the state office, I really had some very <clears throat> flagrant examples of workers being unable to individualize I remember specifically one call from up in the northern part of Idaho that they wondered where they could take these five children and um, because the parents were not good parents and they were going to take the five children away from them and they wondered um, about a specific institution if that was a good one, if that would be all right to take them there. The institution would take the five children. And I said, well, what do you... Why do you, are you calling here? Well, the district supervisor didn't think they should take the children away from the parents. And I said, well, why do you think you should take them away? Well, because their house is dirty and they, and they don't keep it clean or anything. And the children would be much better off in an institution. Well, of course, my reply was, that, would they please hold everything till we could talk? So, of course, it went back to the district supervisor. But some workers were very zealous in... Uh, taking action and um, they saw very superficially what their jobs were but I think this was inevitable you couldn't just bring people in off the street and turn them loose with that much authority and not have uh, some uh, pretty bad decisions made yes that there was no professional training right. at the time I wondered uh what your beginning salary was a state director in Idaho. Can you remember that, Ms. Stidball? Yes, I was a high-priced woman from Seattle. That I was in the press all the time as a high-priced woman from Seattle, and I was paid $350 a month. $350 a month. <laughs> How about you, Mr. Pritchard? What was your first salary? $17.50 a week. A week. Seventeen fifty a week. Now, these were considered good salaries during the Depression days, do you feel? Well, they were salaries, <laughs> let me put it that way. Anyone who had a job in those days was considered very lucky. Well, I think that those of us who had, uh, supposedly had some training, and our training certainly was, uh, was then on the job training, and my training was with the family service where they in Seattle, where they took you in as an apprentice. And uh, you got up to $125 a month, and then you reached the peak. You were really an experienced, trained worker. And uh, that was all the background we had in training when we took on these jobs. We were not e equal to the jobs. We weren't trained well enough for them, but, but there was nothing better afloat. And so they hired us. And certainly, three fifty a month in those days was a good salary, considered a good salary. And um, um, I was paid practically the same, a little bit more, when I came to California with a comparable job. And that was a fifth of Los Angeles County and three seventy-five a month. I assume that uh, at that time it was felt that when the depression was over that there would no, be further, no further need for social services, that it was a temporary kind of program, and that uh, social service was inevitably to end. Of course, this has not been true over the years. And uh, because it was temporary, I assume they quartered you in temporary kinds of offices. I wonder if you could describe the working conditions that you experienced. I'll always remember my first office. I had an old kitchen table for a desk, and the chair I had was a very large Primex 
lard can. And every time I moved, it popped. <laughs> and it took me several weeks before I could get a chair to sit in. <laughs> I like to make a pun of that's can to can. <laughs> I used to make many puns on it, which I can't on this recording. <laughs> and, uh, what were the buildings like that you were in? Well, it was um, an old two-story building. I think it has been a rooming house at one time. And they did remodel this for the uh, transit center, but it was extremely bleak. One of our constant problems were the bed bugs that were in the building. And when I would return home, I was living with my family at that time, I had to undress completely on the back porch and leave all my clothes out there before I could be allowed to enter the house. Mm -hmm. And we tried many ways of getting rid of the bed bugs, and then an old friend of mine told me there was only one way to get rid of them, but it worked. And I valued her judgment, so I carried this out, and why we weren't destroyed, I don't know. I took gasoline and poured it behind every mop board in every room in the building. <laughs> we didn't burn down, and it did get rid of the bed bugs. Yeah, it would. <laughs> <laughs> well, Where were the state offices located, Miss Tidball? The state offices were in the uh, office building in the downtown part of uh, Boise, and the quarters were really very pleasant, and uh, we had good accommodations. The worst social work accommodations I had personally was when I was with the Family Society in Seattle. It was one of my first jobs, and we were in a coal yard out in West Seattle. And uh, the uh, floor, you'd walk across the floor, and the whole building would shake. It was just an old coal yard. And there were terrible conditions, awful working conditions. But otherwise than that, I had very, I've had fairly good working conditions. My comment, my experience in regard to this, <coughs> that in the office in Twin Falls, Idaho, was located in a, an abandoned mortuary, and the county commissioners even refused to paint out the sign mortuary on the welfare office, and we had found a skeleton in a basket in the basement, and that was there for months before we could get the coroner to remove it. And I remember that in Salmon City, in the, I worked in a building that was, the offices were located over a saloon. And uh, at the back of the upstairs was a Holy Roller Church. On Saturday night, they used to shoot up through the floor of the saloon so that we couldn't do any night work on Saturday nights. And on Sunday, the Holy Rollers carried on, and we couldn't do any work on Sundays, even though we were seven-day workers. Ms. Tidball, at the time you came to Idaho, uh, you were considered a, to be a professional social worker. And I wondered, what were your qualifications at that time for being called that. In those days, there were no schools in the West at all, no schools of social work. And the Family Society in Seattle, uh, once, a, uh, once a year, once every two years, took uh, five potentials, and we were students in training. And um, we were given the caseload to carry and very strict supervision. And I was accepted one year for that. And um, I had been a volunteer in the Family S Society. And it was called then the Social Welfare League. And that's how I happened to be selected. And uh, we trained. And we carried a caseload of five. And then we got up to a caseload of ten. 
and uh, we had to drive our own cars and we were paid fifty dollars a month and uh, the training was for two years and then we were called uh, a trained social worker and then we were given the maximum salary of $125 and given a load of 25 cases in the family society. Well, in the meantime, the, um, after a period of service of two and a half to three years, I served only as a substitute worker for family service because I had a child that I need, with whom I needed to be, I needed to be with. And so I substituted when they had vacation needs and that sort of thing in the family agency. Um, then the depression came and uh, the Social Welfare League wanted me to come in and organize the city of Seattle downtown and work with the volunteers to carry um, um, the relief 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 was given out only as food was brought in the city uh, gave out fish and cabbage and this sort of thing it was just whatever people donated and clothes and most of the volunteers were people who had no jobs it was the unemployed and the social unemployed the junior league well this went on so i did this and then this went on and developed into Gradually, we were first the uh, City of Seattle Emergency Relief, and then we went into uh, the county, um, county, and then they organized the uh, State of Washington ERA, and uh, then we became King County Emergency Relief, and then um, my job went uh, simultaneously with it, and then I was the Assistant County Director and was this when I went over and took the job in Idaho. And then after Idaho, you said that you'd come to California and you described some of your work here. But uh, after leaving California, where did you go? Uh, I didn't work at all for three years until my husband died. And then at that point, I went back to the graduate school at the University of Washington. No, at the University of Washington? At the University of Washington. And um, then uh, while I was there, I also served as secretary of the State Conference of Social Work, uh, which, which office was attached to the University of Washington. And um, then from there, I went as director. Executive position in Seattle as the uh, executive of the Travis Aid Society and at that point had enough academic training at the university to realize that what I wanted was some Eastern exposure and also some um, intensified psychiatric. And so I applied at Chicago and New York School and enrolled at New York School. Subsequently, I, from the New York School, I uh, went to uh, uh, Chicago as the executive director there and was there during the World War II and, uh, and the DP um, movement. This and is the executive director of Traveler's Aid. Yeah, Traveler's Aid. Yeah. Wasn't that the largest Traveler's Aid in America? Yeah, that's right. And then also, at the same time, I took graduate courses at the University of Chicago, uh, completing practically two and a half years of graduate all told, um, but never getting my master's degree and which is immaterial to me. <laughs> and from Chicago, I had to take a year off because of fatigue and um, physical, and uh, was sent to Australia as a representative from, from Travelers Aid Societies in America to a world conference on moving people. And uh, then subsequently, I accepted a position as uh, uh, director of for UCDS of the nine western states coordinating the uh, national agencies that were affiliated with UCDS during the Korean War and uh, this program dealt entirely with communities of uh, war impact that had no programs of any kind such as Barstow 
and um, San Bernardino, where basic community organization was was uh, was required and needed. And I would make a preliminary survey, and then the national agent would re send in my report and recommendation relative to which national agency seemed most suited to do the pioneer field work in the community. And uh, often this um, required conferences with several national agencies since all of them were naturally interested in taking some leadership. The purpose of UCDS was definitely to try and avoid the rushing in of all national agencies and try and have one only go in since the communities were small. Um, from that assignment, I then went as um, caseworker uh, in the Los Angeles County Children's Program to place children, but only stayed one year as I could not take the quality of the program and the treatment offered the families and children and left. And then I went as director of the Volunteer Bureau in Pasadena and operated a welfare information service um, in cooperation with Barbara Teese of Los Angeles Welfare Information Service. And uh, from there I went to the uh, uh, city of Pasadena uh, welfare department and was a caseworker there for four and a half years when I retired. Uh, subsequently, I took a part-time job with the Pasadena Day Nursery as a caseworker, working with the um, uh, parents and teachers uh, who had problem children there. This was a part-time job. In the meantime, I have done lots of volunteer work and been very active with it. Continue to make your home in Pasadena. Yes, we continue to live in Pasadena. Uh, Mr. Pritchard, uh, you continued to work in Idaho for a while. I wonder if you describe what your positions were in that state and then what your career has been since then. Well, I worked in the transient uh, program starting in September of '34. I started as a caseworker, then was the supervisor, and for the last several months, I was executive of both the work camp and the treatment center and head of the social service department. Uh, the transient program was um, phased out in September or October of 1935. Uh, I then worked very, very briefly with the WPA in Pocatello. At that time, they were starting uh, the first child welfare service in Idaho. And I was asked to come into that program, which I did. That was in, I, I think, February of 1936. And September of 1936, I went back to the Chicago, but only for a, a quarter, because the state called me back to do some special work in Idaho. I worked in the child welfare program in Idaho until December of 37. Then I returned to the University of Chicago, where I majored in psychiatric social work and administration, and I finished my work in January of 39, returned to Idaho in February of 39 in a position which was a combination of the what we call field representative for the public assistance programs and also the supervisor of the child welfare service programs for the 10 northern counties of Idaho. When the uh, director of child welfare services returned for further social work education in December of 1939, I was appointed acting child welfare 
director. Now, I stayed in that position until June of 1941. I then ex accepted a position teaching at the University of Washington Graduate School of Social Work. Uh, when I first started out, the first two quarters, I was actually half-time at the university and half-time as intake supervisor for the Washington Children's Home Society. I taught casework and child welfare and supervised students. I became a full-time faculty member at the University of Washington in September of that year, and I stayed on until February of 1945. I headed up the last two years I was there what they called the child welfare sequence. In February of, of 1945, I came to Oakland to organize a children's agency. And this I did, and I stayed with that agency until May of 1948. I then was asked to apply for the position of, of the executive of the Children's Bureau of Los Angeles. I applied, and and was appointed director, and I stayed there for 25 years. Ooh, it's a good record. <laughs> I retired in June of 1973. The only professional work I did after my retirement was for about a year and a half. I served as a consultant to an attorney in San Francisco on cases she was handling, problem cases in custody and adoption. Thank you.